everyone, welcome. We have a very important and interesting show for you tonight. We're talking about superbugs, the Zika virus, antibiotic resistance, and who better to join me than Michael Osterholm. He's been on before, one of my favorite guests. He's the former Minnesota State epidemiologist. He is a Regents Professor at the University of Minnesota where you work in three different departments, correct? Yes. Um, he's been a, a consultant to the Center for Disease Control, and he is an author of um, many, many, many abstracts, book chapters, books, a new book coming out. We'll plug it now and then I'll uh, ask him about it in a minute, but it's got a title that grabs our attention. It's called The Deadliest Enemy, Our War Against Killer Germs. So on that note, welcome, Michael. Thank you, Mary. It's so good to have yeah, you. Yeah, good to have you Thank back. You. Um, I want to quote uh, a statistic that really has had me thinking and waking up in the night. Um, by 2050, I read, um, Adele Peters uh, wrote about this, if antibiotic resistance continues on its current trend, 10 million people may die each year from common infections by yes. 2050. Actually, that quote is in somewhat incomplete because that's just in, in the developed world countries as such. Actually, there's a report that was recently released from Great Britain that was the most exhaustive of all the studies that have been done in antibiotic resistance. And when they compiled the likely trends and the numbers with that, by 2050, we're talking about uh, over 300 million people will have died from antibiotic resistance, and it will actually exceed on an annual basis either heart disease or, and cancer. Mm. And it's all because of the fact that with the aging population, the growing world population, and the fact that antibiotic resistance is increasing so greatly, that this is really going to become a major public health crisis. Why is it not a crisis right now? Because we're doing a lot of things wrong. Is it just that the population isn't exposed yet to bugs that we don't have uh, antibiotics for? Well, it is a crisis now. It's just the different kind of crisis. Th think of the following scenario. If tonight we had tornadoes uh, erupting around Minnesota, all the news media would be covering it and right. you know, everything would be down and we'd right. have this immediate issue. That's what many of our crises like Ebola and Zika might be considered like. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, antibiotic resistance is more like a hurricane where it starts the low depression somewhere between Africa and the South American continent and slowly makes its way, gaining head of steam, speed, and da damaging winds until it finally hits landfall here in this country. And by that time when it does hit here, it's, it's, it's hor huge, it's large, it's, uh, and it's real. And that's what antibiotic resistance is. It's growing every day. Uh, the bugs are winning. We knew that they would win eventually. Uh, just based, based on what we call microbial evolution. We can talk about that. And there are things we can do to slow it down, but we're never going to stop it. And right now, we're not even doing a very good job of slowing it down. Why is it? Are, are not enough people scared to death like you? Um... Well, you have to understand, and it's a kind of the history of the world picture that we get this. Uh, there was a fascinating article published several years ago where a group of researchers went back into an area of Carlsbad Caverns that were formed about four million years ago and had mm -hmm. never seen one human mm -hmm. until the 1980s. Wow. When they entered the caverns, the first thing they did in fully protective suits, they actually went in and cultured the walls of the caves. Hmm. And they ended up finding all kinds of bacteria that were highly antibiotic resistant, meaning that mm -hmm. against the things we use, and some of them against the drugs mm -hmm. that we'd actually manufactured and made for today. And the question is, well, how could that have happened? There was no contact with humans. Mm -hmm. We have to understand that since the very beginning of time, the primordial life, microbes have been fighting for space and food. And so the source of antibiotics often actually comes from other microbes. Remember, that's where penicillium mm -hmm. came from. Right. came from the mold, penicillin. Right, the culture. And, mm -hmm. and so what happens is over all these millions of years, microbes themselves have developed, in a sense, antibiotics to kill off their competitors. And with that then, with evolution, they develop resistance because the way to survive getting hit with an antibiotic is to find a way that my cells don't need that antibiotic to be present, or if it is present, I can stop it from doing what it's supposed to do. 
And so we already live in a world of antibiotic resistance. Remember, we are just latecomers in the 1930s when we first discovered penicillin, and all the antibiotics since that time really have, are like a, one speck of sand on a beach. Mm -hmm. And so what's happened is we've greatly accelerated, however, because of the use of antibiotics today. I mean, we talk about using antibiotics by the tons and tons worldwide. And so what's happened is we've lived in this, what I call pre-antibiotic era, the antibiotic era, and now we're beginning to enter the post-antibiotic era. The challenge we have is, one, is slowing down the use of unnecessary antibiotics, which many of them are, so that we don't drive resistance as an evolutionary pressure. The second thing is, is that we have to make new antibiotics that work. The problem is all the easy antibiotics are gone. Um, with, despite massive research going on today, we don't have new classes of antibiotics, and the bugs have basically just kind of caught up with us. So this is a real challenge for us. And compounding it then is that the third world uh, developing countries are using, as you told me earlier, using antibiotics like candy, I believe yeah, you yeah, said. Yeah. Um, and of course, we're using them uh, to uh, make bigger cows and, and pigs. And right. Right now, the, the challenge we have is, is looking at this as a global issue. And in fact, uh, the United Nations actually is meeting on this very issue, and it's only the third health issue in the history of the UN that they've met on. First was is HIV AIDS right? and Ebola. And wow. this meeting is really about trying to understand what can we do with the rest of the world. Remember this, if you take the United States, Europe, New Zealand, put them all together, that's still only about 14% of the world's population. 55% live in what we call the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Mm -hmm. That's where much of the antibiotic use is actually occurring. Uh, for example, in animals alone in China, they use well last year over 80,000 uh, tons of antibiotics mm -hmm. that were used for just producing animals. Mm -hmm. And so when you get into that kind of a category of massive use, um, that drives antibiotic resistance in a very, very big way. And so what we need to do is address this on an international level. It would be like trying to address climate change right, without right. having all countries involved. If and that's just, a great parallel, Mike. Yeah. Um, is, this, is this the meeting you're going to in New York? Yes, actually it is. There's a, a major meeting this week on, for the United Nations on this issue. And part of it is to just begin to look at what can we do. Now, I worry that we do a lot of meetings and we have lots of books that we put out and lots of reports, but limited action. Um, today we live in a post-Ebola world where there was major reports issued uh, really detailing the failure of public health to understand and respond to Ebola. And frankly, very little has been done since that time. We still don't have an effective vaccine that was available. Uh, the infrastructure, the public health uh, capability isn't really any different than it was. Attention uh, has shifted. It's just from attention the media. shifted. Mm -hmm. And so part of it is we just keep forgetting. And Zika is a good example of that. Same thing, we were so ill prepared for Zika, mm -hmm. and we still are ill prepared. So antibiotic resistance is even going to be a, t a tougher nut to crack. Are the, uh, all the players that should be there coming to the UN meeting this week? Well, the players are there. The question is, again, what is the resolve to do something? And one of the reasons I like to come back to climate change is because actually there, we actually have had the resolve. You know, it's still a challenge because we're not doing enough fast enough, but at least we now have every country realizing that they have uh, a skin in the game mm -hmm. and that the implications of climate change are going to be huge for everyone. So when we talk about greenhouse gas emissions, we're not just talking about the United States or Europe or Canada, we're talking about China, we're talking about India, we're talking about the major uh, contributors to this and they see that without dealing with it, the whole world's in trouble. Antibiotic resistance and the need for new antibiotics and the need to limit the use of our current antibiotics to really medically necessary needs is really important. And I think that if nothing else, this meeting is really a first kind of, you might say, wake-up call that this mm -hmm. is really a challenge. And you know, for you and I, yes. we may get out of this world without having uh, experienced an antibiotic-resistant infection that kills us, mm -hmm. but you know what? It's not gonna be like that for our kids and grandkids. Know, that's and that's me. the challenge. Yeah, that scares me so much. Um, it must be so frustrating for you when you know th the realities and yet you know that there's so much persuasion needed to bring everybody in the world on board to, to take, as you say, action. Um, well, you know, one of the things that's a real challenge today is people's unwillingness to accept what's happening right. and deal with it. Right. We just as soon avoid it. Um, you know, I gave my first lecture on Zika virus infection 34 months ago today. Mm. And it said that it was coming, 
that it was going to be a major, major public health issue in the Americas and why it was coming and what we could do about it. And people just poo-pooed it. Uh, and then tell a year ago. And then we could have had two years of prep time. Yeah, isn't and, that and you know, I think that, that we see that often. You know, um, I wrote a piece in the summer of 2014 in the Washington Post, an, an editorial, on why the world had to wake up that this new emerging Ebola crisis in West Africa was different than ever before. It wasn't like the old Ebola, and it wasn't because the virus changed, it's because Africa's changed. Mm -hmm. The mega cities today of Africa are the fastest growing cities in the world. I mean, when you look at a place like that. Kinshasa with 14 million people and over half of them living in the most destitute slums you could imagine, I mean, that's unheard of. Mm -hmm. uh, West Africa is the same way. And so what I wrote in this piece was that Africa's changed and we have to understand we're no longer dealing with just little bonfire potential. We're dealing with mm -hmm. big forest fire potential. Mm -hmm. and, but the world doesn't often address those issues and they still aren't today. Sometimes when I mention your name as a guest, I'm hoping to, to uh, line up, et cetera, people will say, well, don't you think he's a little um, overdramatic? And I'll say, no, no, no. But I think there's that people don't want to believe. What, well, you know, one of the things I go back on, it was, it was very interesting because um, um, not long ago, the uh, um, BBC actually ran a piece uh, and a, a retread piece from somebody who had written it several years ago about me being such a you know scary guy Doom, and that doomsday. you know basically a doomsday and uh -huh. not true. And what they said is is that in this piece I had said smallpox was not done yet. We would find it in freezers and that the potential for it to come back was real. That mosquito-borne diseases were going to spread around the world in ways we'd never seen before and that diseases like Ebola were going to emerge in the megacities of the developing world and it was going to fundamentally change these little 40 and 50 person outbreaks to thousands of persons outbreaks. And so what they did is the reason they wrote it because I had said earlier in the Ebola outbreak this was going to change and they were saying, well, this guy is just scary, just miss him. <laughs> what they forgot to do is go back and actually fact check it and every one of those things I said happened. They I just took it. several years it. to happen. And, well, and the I think people in the know the, know that you're. Yeah, you I think know. that's the challenge: is how do you mm -hmm. get people? And you know, our job is my job is not to scare people out of their wits; it's to scare them into their wits. Yes, yeah, so uh, and a good this way is what my it. new book is about. I actually have a nine-point plan that says, you know, we can take all of these pretty much off the table as major crises, but this is what we have to do. A good example today: I, I co-chair a group right now on Ebola vaccines with Jeremy Fair from the Wellcome Trust in London. And we have 28 international experts that are really trying to move Ebola vaccines through. We got to get them done. Because tomorrow, what happened in West Africa could be so much different if this ignites in Kinshasa or Lagos, Nigeria, or places like that. It could make what we've been through two years ago child's play. Mm -hmm. Now, if we had a, an effective vaccine today and we could vaccinate all the healthcare workers, the emergency responders, the burial team members, and, and the mortuary science expert people in Africa, we could basically put enough rods in that beginning reaction mm -hmm. of an outbreak to keep it from ever blowing up. Mm -hmm. Now, why are we not doing this? Yeah. It's not about cr imagination. It's not money. Or even, it, it was it? even in, in a sense, money. I mean, we're going to spend so much more when it finally happens. Right. We just always are caught behind the eight ball. Mm -hmm. And so our job is to, right now is to try to get this done and to try to make sure we never have another Ebola outbreak like that. You said that you've been talking to Bill Gates, yes. and he's very supportive of your work and yes. vice versa. Um, is he interested in putting foundation money yeah. into this? You know, Bill and Melinda Gates have been in, beyond a gift to our world. Yes. What they have done through the Gates Foundation has basically held up the rapidly falling tent of public health around the world. And, but for them, I don't know where we'd be today. Mm. And so, you know, but there's only much, even so much they can do without sure. global support and interaction and so forth. Um, you know, we had a whole series of reports that came out after the Ebola outbreak. And one of the reports uh, came from the World Health Organization itself. Others were groups that commented on the World Health Organization. And they all said, we need to completely redo the World Health Organization. It, it mm. needs really changing. And so at this last General Assembly meeting where the 197 countries got together, they said, okay, let's reorganize our emergency response capability. What they did is they just shuffled the chairs on the deck of the Titanic. They gave them no mm -hmm. new money, said you go mm -hmm. out and find any new money if you need it. Mm -hmm. And they gave them no new authority mm -hmm. and now expected somehow we did something. And 
that's why we're so ill prepared for so many of these crises. Uh, yellow fever right now in in, in, right. West, in Africa, Reading and, about and them. you know, and pandemic flu could emerge tomorrow. So one of the things we have to understand is is that there's an old commercial, a uh, Fram oil filter commercial when we were younger, they used to say, pay me now or you'll pay me later. Mm -hmm. And I think Never. that we're finally understanding, and Zika is a good example. I mean, look at in this country. That's, Here we have this crisis emerging, and we can't get Congress to act. Let's talk a, just a little bit specifically about Zika. Sure. Because you said, and I failed to tell the audience, viewers, that you are the director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy <laughs> at the U. Um, but you said you're getting inundated by calls about Zika. Um, so how contagious is it, Mike? Um, and what can people do to avoid it? Well, first of all, it's a, an infectious agent that is challenging our knowledge about infectious diseases. And I say that because historically, mosquito-borne diseases, diseases transmitted by mosquitoes, only are transmitted, first of all, by the female, who takes blood meals from humans or animals, uh, and for laying her eggs, she needs that for her eggs. And when they take a blood meal, if they're feeding on someone who is infected with a virus or a parasite, and they're themselves susceptible to it, then they can become infected. Out of the over 3,000 species of mosquitoes, only about 30 actually carry any mm. kind of infectious disease. Mm. Of those that carry diseases, some only carry certain ones, and others don't, and mosquitoes are all different. The mosquito that carries Zika, Aedes aegypti, is basically the cockroach of, of mosquitoes. It mm -hmm. lives in human context. It lives in close contact with us in uh, cups of water like this, or bottle caps, or discarded garbage, et cetera. Whereas the mosquitoes that transmit malaria tend to live in the jungle bush. They tend to live mm -hmm. in large bodies of water kind of thing. Very different. Specific, yeah. um, and so we have to always understand which mosquito. Well, what's happened is, think about this. In the 1900s, we couldn't build the Panama Canal because so many people died from yellow fever. And it was only with extensive elimination of Aedes aegypti that we did that. Well, by the 1970s, the Rockefeller Foundation, together with the Panamanian Health Organization, virtually eradicated Aedes aegypti out of the Americas. We hardly had any of it left here. And then everybody gave up and said, well, we're done. Well, today, we have more extensive Aedes aegypti in the Americas and around the world than we've ever had in history. Mm -hmm. It's not just the locations, mm -hmm. but it's the amount. And so we were primed for this outbreak with Zika. So are we going to see more Well, of that's it? what I'm coming to. So if, if you look today, we all thought, well, the Zika is going to be transmitted by Aedes aegypti. It's a problem. It lives in our close right. to it. Well, it turns out now it's a sexually transmitted disease, too. That's right. why I said it's challenges. Right. So you get infected by a mosquito, but then you may become infectious yourself through sexual contact. We've never so had a mosquito-borne disease do that mm -hmm. before. So now you've got kind of two barrels firing at you. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, people are staying infected for days. We now have people up to 180 days after they were infected still potentially infected with the virus and transmitting it. Oh, and they're able to spread it then spread longer it. than most. And then, and then the worst issue of all is about 80% of people actually don't show signs or symptoms, which you could oh. say is a good thing. The problem is if you travel to one of these areas and you're a yeah. sex partner of, uh, of, of, for example, a male, of a woman who wants to become pregnant, is going to become pregnant or is pregnant, and you come home feeling totally fine yeah. and you transmit the virus to that woman, yeah. it's that unborn fetus that's at very high risk of severe, severe health outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so you're surprised. You said, I had no idea that I was even exposed. Right. And so now we're seeing this whole issue. And the impact this is having on unborn children right now I, it's, it's hard to describe. In, in a place well, so like uh, Puerto Rico, we're green estimating... Green damage. And the, about 5% of the population is getting infected each month. So within really? a couple of years, most of them have been infected. That's really? involving several thousand pregnancies a month in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of these kids, our best guesstimate, may cost anywhere from 10 to $25 million over a lifetime just to care for them, mm -hmm. based on the health needs they're going to have with mm -hmm. the severe neurologic damage. Mm -hmm. And we're putting but virtually no money into families. it to prevent it. Yes. Oh, oh. So, I mean, there's an example. Could you make a more compelling argument why we should be investing resources in mosquito control right now? Right, right. And we can't even get Congress to act on anything. Our government's about ready to run out of money on Zika work. They've taken, they've borrowed from Peter and Paul to pay for everything right now that's being done, and they don't have any more money to rob from Peter and Paul. Do you think there's any chance with um, a different leadership uh, Clinton versus Obama, things could get better. Um, Trump 
yeah. versus well, you know, uh, Obama uh, Mary, and you know this. Worse. You know, I've served in the last five presidential administrations. Right. I've served two Republican governors, two Democratic governors, and as I jokingly say, one independent wrestler. <laughs> and um, yeah. you know, no one has ever known my partisan politics. I've, I, I've I've always just been a person in the army of government, trying to do the best I can. Um, this election does scare me, uh, and it scares me a great deal because while I, again, I'm not partisan as such, Mr. Trump's anti-science agenda is scary as hell. Mm -hmm. And basically, whether it's climate change or vaccines or whatever, you know, if that becomes the norm, all the problems that we're talking about right now are going to get a hell of a lot worse quick. Mm -hmm. And so, to me, it's not that I'm for a candidate as such, as again, nonpartisan, but I can just tell you that the scientific rhetoric and the science world has stake? never been more frightened mm -hmm. of that potential. Mm -hmm. And this is not a Democrat or Republican science world. You know, mm -hmm. I've worked with outstanding Democrats, I've worked with outstanding Republicans, but they've always based it on the best science. And we worry desperately about that. Well, that, I hope people are listening up. Um, let's talk about what people can do to protect themselves that are just basic, um, logical ideas, but important. Um, well, first of all, we have to deal with the antibiotic use. Today, we use antibiotics as if, well, I may have a sore throat, I may have this, mm -hmm. I want somebody to take care mm -hmm. of it. The vast majority so quit of antibiotic pushing use. your doctor. Yeah, don't. I mean, the yeah. doctor needs to make a decision based on the real mm -hmm. medical information. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is we've got to get antibiotics out of agriculture in a way that they're used today. Uh, a, a sick animal should be treated. Now but we shouldn't be using at... antibiotics to keep animals mm -hmm. from getting infected because of poor hygiene, for example, or, or crowding and so forth. Um, we need to uh, develop vaccines today that uh, are effective so that we don't even get infected with these antibiotic resistant strains. And again, there's not big markets for these right now, and so the investment's not there. But the GAIN Act, I, I read, is, is a, a small positive thing on the horizon. Right. Well, what we're looking at today is, part of it is trying to understand which of the infectious agents are most likely to be drug resistant and mm -hmm. cause us the problem. So rather than try to treat them, prevent them from happening. So one of the areas that is being looked at, and actually I'm part of another group called CIPI, the Coalition mm -hmm. for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. And this is a group that includes the Wellcome Trust, the Gates Foundation, uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, and others, to try to develop vaccines that don't have immediate market potential, but they will down the road, but we can't wait until that happens. So we need to get them now so that we're ready to go when these things emerge. And antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria and even viruses today are a very real part of that. Uh, so, so that's really an issue right now, trying to bring together collectively this money. And I'm actually hopeful about that one. It's just a mm. question of how much can get done. Mm. So that's, yeah, that sounds hopeful. I mean, there are some hopeful things. Well, and, um, and, and I come back to my book, because again, as I said, yeah. my job is not to scare people out of their wits, it's to scare them into their wits. And you know, for all the challenges and the problems that I lay out, I have a, you know, lay out a solution for every one of them. How we could take pandemic influenza off the table. How can we greatly reduce the impact of, of drug resistance? How can we actually begin to deal with diseases like MERS, this Middle Eastern Respiratory mm -hmm. Syndrome? Uh, deal with Zika, what can vaccines do? How do we deal with the issue between animals and humans and what goes on there? How to deal with bioterrorism? There's a lot we can do there. Mm -hmm. How to deal with designer bugs today? today we're doing things in high school bi microbiology labs that 40 years ago only the most uh, sophisticated bioterrorism labs in Russia and the United States could do. It's really? just because of technology oh, wow. and how it's, how it's changed. How do we deal with these things? They all have solutions. It's not hopeless, it's not, but we've got to stay in, and pay attention and we've got to invest in them. You um, shared with me just a few minutes before we started taping that John Barry who wrote about the 1918 flu uh, pandemic yeah. is uh, going to be uh, plugging your book yeah. as one of yeah. the, the uh, supporters. Um, and tell, tell the audience, tell me again what he wrote. I mean, it's Well, no, so John just basically said, you know, that this is science and it's, it's, you know, it's scary, but it's real science. But it's also a book that lays out a agenda that says, you know, you can do this and this is how we can do it. It's no beam me up Scotty machines. It's no, you know, hope is not a strategy or a, an approach. It's about what can be done. The challenge for us is to do it. 
You know, it's, it's, we are great at crisis. A bridge collapses. Everybody goes and fixes the bridge right away mm -hmm. at great fanfare. Mm -hmm. But how many other bad bridges are there out there? Mm -hmm. You know, the same thing is true with infectious yeah, diseases. We wait too long, don't The we? difference is what people understand is in 1900, average life expectancy in this country was 48 years. 48 mm -hmm. years. By today, just 110 years, 115 years later, we're talking about 78 years. For every three days we've lived, we've gained a day of life expectancy. Now, it took us 80,000 generations to get to, think of it. to get to the caves to 1900. Mm -hmm. So why did it take so long? Well, it was public health. It's clean water, fresh water, safe water. It's about uh, having vaccines. It's about antibiotics. And what's happening, though, is we lose our antibiotics we now realize we're starting to slip back into those ages when people died from infections that today we would think of that would be a calamity if people were to die from that. We're now starting to see them die mm -hmm. and we can't treat them. And so we have to understand we're going to start slipping backwards, not going forward. And that's what's happened. And the people that will be most vulnerable will be the very young and the very old? They will be, but in fact, as antibiotic resistant becomes more common and more different infectious agents, it's going to be all ages. Mm, okay. And again, well, like in 1918, it actually hit the flu, young, flu actually hit the youngest, the young adults the that worst, so and that was actually the way the virus actually yeah, that acted. Was... But think about just I, as I shared with you earlier, we have the highest levels of Aedes aegypti mosquito in the history of humankind, in more places in the Americas than ever, and you think, and we almost eradicated it 40 years ago. I mean, one of the saddest tragedies today that's happening right underneath our nose, 40 years ago, Venezuela was the first country in the world to eradicate malaria, the mosquito that causes that. Well, they, they got were, rid of it. They today, they are in major crisis because when their economy fell apart with the oil market uh, basically imploding, et cetera, the government graft, the unemployment rate went all to the ceiling. All these professionals are unemployed, so what did they do? They started working in the illegal mines, the gold mines outside of the large cities where we had then the issue with malaria starting to spread again there, and now today they are in free fall with malaria, now being transmitted in the cities. So don't do as they do. Well, but the whole point is we can slip back. Yeah. If we don't yeah. move forward, yeah. we're going to go back to these old backwards. days. Well, Mike, thank you so much for coming and getting us more aware <laughs> and helping us well, you thank know, you for see helping the reality. The message. Well, you're welcome. Um, as, as we talked about earlier, and we'll put this uh, book up so you can see it, uh, his book is coming out in March of 2017. It's called Deadliest Enemy, Our War Against Killer Germs. And it sounds, I'm anxious to read it. It sounds <laughs> well, wonderful. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, we have one more uh, plug, though, too. Uh, I want you to, if you want to learn more about Mike, what he's doing, and what the center where he works, uh, one of his many places where he plugs in, uh, SIDRAP, you can go to www.sidrap.umn.edu. Well, thanks again. Thank you very much. Maybe Mary. you can come back when the book is out. I'll be out. happy. Anytime, Mary, I come back. Happy. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Me. Thanks for being with us. We'll be back again next week. Until then, have a good week. Thank you.